All right, welcome everyone. Um, I think we're going to get started now. Um, so welcome to the Nuclear Institute's webinar supported by the UK Atomic Energy Authority. Um, David Martin has sent his apologies. Uh, unfortunately, he's been called out to deal with some urgent business this morning. Um, so he won't be able to host the webinar personally. But Chris Warwick, who's the Communications Director at the Cullen Center for Fusion Energy, has kindly agreed to host. Um, so there's going to be time for any questions you might have at the end. Um, please type these into the um, Q&A box throughout the presentation and I can read these out to Chris once he's finished his presentation. Um, further to this um, today, if you're interested in learning more about fusion, um, the UK AEA and the Nuclear Institute are holding a two-day conference at the University of Oxford on the 8th and 9th of November, which includes the opportunity to take a technical tour of JET and the UK AEA's new robotics and materials research facilities. We're offering a special deal for conference bookings um, today only, but if you place your booking using the discount code webinar, you can um, receive your booking at the NI corporate member rate. Um, this webinar is going to be recorded um, and the recording will be available following the webinar and I'll email this out to everyone who's registered. Um, thanks for your time today and I'll now pass you on to Chris. All right. Chris, can you hear? Yep. Yep. Hi. Is that all okay? Yeah, yep. Can hear you. You're good to go. Thank Brilliant. you. Thanks very much. Um, Right, rather bizarre for me to do a webinar. I've done hundreds of talks over the years, not a webinar before, so I'm just going to have to imagine you laughing at my jokes rather than actually people really laughing. Um, this will be 20, 25 minutes, um, and then obviously a chance for questions at the end, which I'm more than happy to take. Um, so I'll take you on a, um, a quick trip through fusion research, what we do here at Cullum, um, and, and try and indicate uh, any significant overlaps with the nuclear industry more widely, which is obviously uh, appropriate to many of you, I would imagine. Starting uh, from real basics, uh, fusion is obviously the process by which energy is released from two small nuclei sticking together rather than a big nuclei splitting apart. Um, the basic physics in the middle is exactly the same. Um, in other words, you are releasing energy from the, the lost mass of the reaction, uh, as you can see there. Um, but, but the whole process is very, very different in, in the science and technology behind it, and I'll, I'll go into that as I, I go through the talk. Um, sticking together uh, light nuclei uh, is what happens in the sun. I'll come on to that in a minute, which is protons, pure hydrogen sticking together. Um, over several stages of a reaction that releases, um, that makes helium and releases energy and makes the sun shine. Um, it's long been a, um, a goal of mankind to harness that, um, that huge amount of energy and, and, and per kilogram of, of fuel of fusion is 10 times more um, efficient than fission, 10 million times more efficient than burning fossil fuels. So a hugely potent way of making energy from very little material with many advantages over almost every other energy source but incredibly difficult to do. Um, before I leave this slide, the, the actual reaction we get going is not um, what the sun does, protons sticking together to make helium over several stages, which is actually a very slow and ponderous reaction. Um, this is, we actually use the reaction uh, deuterium and tritium, as you can see here, deuterium coming in from the right, tritium in from the left, both heavy isotopes of hydrogen. Um, tritium being radioactive and, and rather unpleasant, so we have the ability to deal with that and store and use tritium here on JET, um, which is unique to, to worldwide fusion devices. Um, those two uh, uh, isotopes will react to make helium, as you can see coming out bottom left, and a single extra neutron bottom right, both of which coming out with much more energy than went in. Um, the big, Many of the big challenges with fusion stem from the fact that, that this does not um, as many of you will know, happen at room temperature. Um, unlike fission, which does, um, here you have to create really crazy conditions to make it happen. Um, conditions akin to, to the temperature and pressure at the center of the sun, only even more extreme than that. Um, and actually on the next slide, that go into detail there. Um, at room temperature, despite what cold fusion people may tell you, fusion does not work on a nuclear level. Um, therefore, we have to create this very hot gas or plasma of fuels. In other words, we have to heat the fuels up just like the sun does. 
um, we very quickly ionize um, the, the, the neutral atoms of deuterium and tritium and we're now dealing with just nuclei to bring those nuclei close enough together um, you have to basically heat them up get them moving fast enough so they'll overcome the, the Coulomb repulsion they will see get close enough to each other for the strong force to pull them in and stick them and start the reaction going that temperature in the Sun is around 15 million degrees in the core of the Sun degrees centigrade or Kelvin um, doesn't really matter um, that produces the heat and light coming out of the Sun um, and, and keeps the whole thing at 15 million degrees but the, the, the whole thing is a balance you have to be 15 million degrees for it to happen and because it's happening it's creating the conditions to keep it at 15 million degrees as long as there's enough fuel in there um, we have to for the for the deuterium tritium reaction to get temperatures up to around 10 times hotter than that so when jet is running again next year we're, we're in a, a major upgrade period at the minute but we'll be we'll be doing experiments again next year um, we'll be routinely 20 30 times a day creating plasmas for 10 20 30 seconds at 150 to 200 million degrees centigrade um, and starting to study um, how the plasma behaves and, and, and its interaction with the wall etc as I'll explain in a minute but you're dealing with a very different reaction to fission you're having to deal with this very energetic electrical gas called a plasma inherently unstable um, and you're having to create really ridiculous temperatures to make the, the, the fusion reaction work final thing to note is that, that gravity does all the confinement for the Sun it, it's extremely massive um, very very many kilograms so gravity holds it all in that lovely spherical shape that you can see um, we have to do something different on, on a much smaller scale here on earth um, and I'll go on to that in a second a little bit about Cullum um, we are at what is left of the much bigger UK Atomic Energy Authority all of the the, the previous nuclear fission sites such as Doonray, Winfrith and Harwell to name just three are, are now being decommissioned um, and, and, and uh, in, in various parts of the private sector in the NDA um, we are what is left of the UK Atomic Energy Authority here at Cullum Cullum is about 10 miles south of Oxford and there is an aerial view of the site um, you could see originally an airfield very much from the, the geography of the, the site from above um, two major fusion experiments here um, JET is the joint European Taurus um, is Europe's fusion experiment has been here since 1983 when it first started its very first experiment and I'll talk a bit more about that in a second we have a second UK experiment um, called MAST currently being upgraded and shortly to be called MAST upgrade um, and we've built two new facilities here in, in, in the last 18 months to two years um, to to look into the technology of fusion I'll come on to that a bit later on what really stands between us and a fusion power plant um, let's say in, in the years around 2050 um, are getting the technology right getting the materials right doing the robotics properly um, those are the things that, that uh, you know a company wanting to put fusion on the grid will really care about so there is a brand new robotics center here called race which is a key part of that technology and a new materials research facility as well and I'll explain a bit more about both those facilities later on um, but as you can see a, a large site with, with plenty of space for us to to expand and build new buildings um, a little bit then about JET um, JET is the joint European tourist the picture on the right there shows you um, a standard European person stood up next to it so in total about 18 meters high um, the vessel in the middle is, which is the bit that really matters is where you put the plasma um, that is around five meters high two meters across so right round that ring is a round little bit less than hundred cubic meters of volume um, around the the ring 32 of them and you can see them in green tight in around the, the vessel um, are um, enormous magnetic field coils we essentially replace gravity in our experiments with magnetic fields and we use the action of the magnetic fields on the electrically charged plasma in that vessel the magnetic fields act to control manipulate and move the plasma predict especially move it away from the walls um, which is really important if we want to get the temperature up to those kind of uh, levels um, I would stress we are dealing in jet with just a very small amount of fuel at any one point in time in that volume we only have around a hundredth of a gram <coughs> of plasma at any one point in time so even though it's 150 million degrees if we do lose control of it and it hits the wall it doesn't melt the whole machine because there's a very small amount of it 
So it's a very high temperature, but a very low density around an atmosphere of pressure, actually, as it happens. Um, this device, since the year 2000, has been operated by us, UK Atomic Energy Authority, for Europe. So we are given a grant by Europe to provide, of the order, 400 engineers to keep this thing running, to upgrade it, to to sit, you know, to work with Europe to work out how um, and how we can resource making it better, more powerful, um, so we can understand more towards a power plant. Um, and that that's, but but we do not do all of the experiments. The experiments, a bit like CERN, are conducted by European teams coming in and visiting. So when we're running pretty much all of next year. Um, as I say, we're coming to the end of a major shutdown at the minute to, to upgrade and do um, some maintenance, but mostly upgrade of the machine, um, interior and, and, and exterior. Um, next year, we'll have as many as 200 scientists visiting from all over Europe at any one point in time, um, running experiments that they would have prepared and bid, had accepted uh, and be given time on the machine to run. Pretty much all those experiments aimed towards JET successor ETA, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, and, and on towards what a power station will one day look like. That, that's roughly how it works. Two things make JET unique. One, uh, the ability to store and use tritium, as I said earlier, and linked with that, because by using tritium in the machine, not all the time, um, the last time we did tritium in anger um, in a proper 50-50 mix um, with deuterium was 1997. We don't do it very often because we don't want to make the machine too radioactive. But because of that um, and the ability to use tritium, we have a remote handling capability, full remote handling capability inside the machine. Um, there is one of our remote handling operators in a control room. And when we're doing the upgrade work, which we're doing at the minute, we're changing tiles around inside the machine, um, changing components, uh, calibrating diagnostics, whatever it might be. Um, that is all done with the pair of remote arms that you can see there, bottom uh, right um, in the machine. That is controlled exactly by the operator, um, with the really clever bit being that he has force feedback feeling of what the other arms are doing. So if he's screwing a tile down, he gets th that feeling right the way back through to, to his or her fingertips back in the control room. We do do pretty much everything inside. Occasionally we send people in. We are able to do that. It's not so active. We can't. Um, when we just need to do something very quickly, or, or it's something that, that we have not done before with the robotic arms. But um, almost all tasks are done like this, simple screwing and unscrewing and fixing. But we've also welded in there. We've sawn things. We've done pretty much every um, kind of uh, action that you would wish to do uh, with a person we can do with, with that system. That is incredibly important for future machines um, because uh, they will be so active that the access to the interior to, to replace components will not be able to be done with um, with manned intervention. So we know that this is a big part of what a future power plant looks like, a full remote handling capability both inside the machine and outside it. Um, and we're working closely with industry to, to win bids on the next machine um, along. I'll talk about that a bit more in a minute. Um, but also work out what remote handling will look like um, in future power plants. Really, really key part of uh, fusion technology. And that next machine is called ITER, the International Tokamak Experimental Reactor. ITER to scale um, is like that to JET. Um, so there at the bottom of ITER is a standard international person giving you some scale. The volume of, of the vessel is now not um, 100 cubic meters, but the best part of 1,000 cubic meters. So the plasma in ITER will be eight or 900 cubic meters. That really matters. Um, a bigger plasma holds energy in longer and fusion gets going better. Um, so it, this is to do with uh, volume to surface ratio. It doesn't radiate power out of its edges easily. Um, so the temperature inside it is retained for longer. The confinement is better. And we know that all the predictions tell us that ITER will produce 500 megawatts of neutrons out for about 50 megawatts in, reversing the fact that jet at best can produce 16 and we hope in future years maybe 20 to 25 megawatts out but with more power going in to heat the plasma up jet is not, just not big enough to get past break even in that regard ITER may look very similar to jet but is much cleverer in all the technologies the coils on jet are copper 
the coils in ETA are superconducting. So the big brown coils you see there are niobium-10. Um, they're superconducting down at liquid helium temperatures. Um, and this is an incredibly difficult machine to put together. It's, it's in the midst of being constructed at the minute. I'll show you another slide in a second. But to give you an idea of the complexity, the plasma in the middle of ETA will be the hottest place on Earth, 150, 200 million degrees. The outside around the coils will be the coldest place on Earth at four degrees Kelvin liquid helium. So that just gives you one, one element of the engineering challenge that we face in putting this incredibly complex machine together. ETA, as the name suggests, is international. So there are the flags along the bottom of, of all seven partners, um, uh, China, the EU, Russia, Japan, the USA, uh, South Korea and India. I'm sure most of you know the flags anyway. Um, 14 billion euros um, being fed in. Very roughly, Europe pays half. The others all pay around 8% because it is sited in Europe in Cadarache in the south of France. Construction began 2008 and we expect operation to start in 2025. Um, it, when I said that, that those partners put money in, that's, that's a little disingenuous. Uh, their industry bids for and wins contracts. So the money is really all in kind and industry builds their share of the project. Um, and to give you an idea of, of how things have evolved, there is a picture of the site at Cadarache uh, back in 2007-8 when the project started officially. Um, they had to go down a long way to put all the foundations in and everything. That was a picture a year or so back of the foundations coming right up. Um, and this is the assembly hall that now looks even shinier than that where components are now arriving and starting to be put together. Um, a genuinely collaborative project um, to, to get towards the cusp of the first power station. This is in many ways a prototype power plant. It will not turn a generator and put electricity on the grid, but it will put all the engineering together um, to, to really start to demonstrate the viability um, of fusion. Um, in many ways, uh, the, the future of fusion it is not now how we can control and hold a plasma um, and get more power out than in. We, we, we know enough from JET and other experiments around the world to, to know we can do that. The challenge now, standing between us and commercial fusion power, um, is all the technologies, some of the stuff I've spoken about, the right materials that are resistant to the neutrons that are very damaging to many materials, remote handling. All of these things are what um, a, a company who, who want to put this on the grid will care about. Um, they will they will want to know the economics is maximized. And at the minute, it, it isn't because we don't know enough about the technology. So, so those are the big things. Um, and just to stress on that, here are six of the big challenges, um, many of which I've just talked about. Yes, we still need to optimize the way the plasma behaves, but, but that's probably the least important looking forward to the first power stations. Um, dealing with very high heat fluxes on materials, we need to exhaust the helium out of the plasma. That requires heat fluxes of the order 10 megawatts a square meter. Um, a, akin to a, a, what a space shuttle sees on re-entry or a, a, a Soyuz does with Tim Pekin, for instance. Getting the materials right, materials of the main structure of the machine that do not get too damaged by 14 MeV neutrons, which are, are faster than fission and therefore more damaging. Um, technology generally, welding, putting, putting different materials together, finding the right ceramics and alloys that, that fit the right purpose. There are many smaller technical uh, challenges that, that stand between us and a power plant. Dealing with uh, putting tritium into the machine, storing it, getting it back out again, in particular um, extracting it from the walls of the chamber and from water any cooling water around the machine is something that we need to, to really perfect and um, we're in a very good position at Cullum to start on that work and already are um, and doing the robotics that we need to do. Um, the interior of a fusion power station one day as you saw earlier from JET is, is much more complex than the interior of a fission plant um, and the robotics is therefore much more challenging with uh, the addition that we have to do robotics X vessel for future machines as well as interior as well. So those are the big challenges um, and uh, as a lab we are looking to, to try and meet those big challenges and work towards the first power plants and put the UK in prime position 
to, to lead the world on, on fusion when we get into delivery around the middle of this century. Um, I'll come back to that in a second. RACE um, is the first of those new facilities, particularly in robotics. This is remote applications in challenging environments, now a fully operational centre and has been for, for, for a year and a half. Um, this is the base by which we work with industry for them to win contracts on ITER um, overall, not just in robotics. We've already, UK business companies have already won 500 million pounds worth of contracts on ITER with more to come, we hope. Um, many of those have been in the robotics areas uh, because we have an expertise from JET and we work with UK industry to maximise that. Um, but also, um, we, we will hope to start to and have already engaged a little with companies in other areas. Robotics is much wider than fusion. Um, fission decommissioning is one area where we're already working with companies to try and find novel solutions or races, but that might stretch as far as deep sea exploration space. All of the areas you don't want to put a person, but you need to put a robot. Um, race will, will have some expertise and, and will try and, and help find solutions in other areas and that does include driverless cars. There is a, a driverless car company at Race that, that is developing the kind of sensors that we would be interested in for, for driverless vehicles that we would find useful in fusion and fission. The other facility is a materials research facility um, taking pieces of either fission or fusion material and there is a big overlap with fission here. We can take a very small piece of uh, fatigued material from a fission power station and we can work out how fatigued it is. So we can cut it down very small. We can cut microscopically small cantilevers. You can see bottom left there compared to a human hair. You can take a very small cantilever of a piece of material. Um, you can bend it backwards and forwards on a, on a very small nano indenter machine um, and, and determine its structural strength on an extremely small scale. Um, that is important to us. We are not a fully licensed site here, nor will we ever be at Cullum. Um, therefore, we have to do things on a small scale to fit in with the fact we're not a licensed site. Um, this means we can work very closely with university materials groups um, on all sorts of challenges for fusion. So take 14 MeV irradiated material and test its strength, um, but also take material from fission and from other areas uh, and do testing on a microscopic scale. So those are two of the big areas um, and we're looking to, to expand into technology facilities in other areas as well. Um, we, there, there is a great opportunity for UK industry in that regard, and we would hope to work with them to win even more contracts on ITA. But longer term, you would wish for UK AEA and more specifically the UK to lead, take, we are leading in fusion at the minute, to carry on that lead to the delivery era for, for power plants. Um, and genuinely be, be selling power plants to the world. That's the, the long-term aspiration. Um, finally, if it's so difficult, why do you bother is a question I get asked quite often. Um, this really is, in, in my view, the holy grail of making electricity. Um, no real environmental impact, just like fission, of course, and renewables in terms of carbon emissions. Um, but unlike fission, um, there is no radioactive waste product per se. Helium is the main waste product from the reaction that you make. Um, there is radioactivity in the structure of the machine. The tritium gets embedded in the structure. That's a half-life of around 11 years. Um, and you activate, uh, by the neutron irradiation, you activate the structure as well. Um, but, but all of those, both the tritium retention and um, neutron activation, tend to create um, waste products with half-lives of around 10 years. So we're looking at 50, 60 years decommissioning um, and nothing requiring uh, deep geological storage. No real risk of a critical safety event. To put it bluntly, fusion is so hard to do, it will always stop itself. That plasma will always find a way to stop itself. If it's not happy, it's too unstable, you put too much gas in, there, there is always a way in which it will stop itself. It makes it very difficult, but it also, by definition, makes it very safe. Um, and the fuels are really abundant. Um, deuterium, freely available in water, one in 8,000 water molecules, very roughly. Um, what I will say very quickly uh, is about the tritium. Tritium, by definition, very rare, um, because it's a short half-life. There isn't very much around. The tritium on jet we acquire from Canada, from the Candu reactors. Uh, it's a byproduct. We're going to need to breed tritium in a power plant. 
one day um, using lithium blankets. In other words, we use the neutrons coming out, we embed them into the lithium blanket. Um, the lithium reacts with the neutron to make enough tritium to feed the cycle. So the lithium is actually our other fuel um, as well as the deuterium. Lithium being abundant, um, certainly in, in the Earth's reserves up in the Andes, um, in the high salt plains of the Andes, much, much more in seawater. Um, so you're looking at certainly millions of years of supply for a reasonably large fraction of the electricity market being, being fusion um, in the years uh, 2050 and after. Finally, to, to follow on from Andrea at the very beginning, um, I will plug the, uh, as you would expect me to, uh, the UKA NI joint conference on realizing a fusion power plant. The challenges, going into much more detail in the challenges I've just spoken about, um, the robotics and the materials, those kind of things. Um, in sessions that are it, what is parallel and, and, and synergistic with the fission industry and what is unique to fusion. Um, a day and a half conference at Wolfson College in Oxford, 8th and 9th of November, as you can see there. There is the link if you wish to write it down, but go to the Nuclear Institute website and you'll find it under events. Um, Andrea may well reiterate that, that the rates again um, do it much better than I will um, with um, the, the, the the second half of the second day on the 9th being a visit here to Cullum um, to see for real what I've just showed you in pictures. Um, that's just about me done in about 25 minutes, so I guess that's about right. Um, yeah, so great. happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, so we've got a few questions that have come through, so it might be easiest if I just read them out to you if that's okay. Yeah. Um, so uh, we've got um, one from um, John Fulch, um, he's asking, um, how do you propose to extract um, energy from fusion and um, convert it to electricity? As far as I'm aware, the plasma collapses as soon as it hits solid material, melting said material, so heat exchange to steam seems unfeasible to me without, um, sorry if I don't pronounce this correctly, um, unobtanium? Yeah, okay. Um, uh, I picked up a little bit on that on breeding the tritium but it's a good point and I didn't get a chance to raise it. Um, you, you, you will not rely on the plasma touching anything to extract the energy out but most of the, the actual energy uh, from fusion comes out in those neutrons so you will have a flux of billions and billions of neutrons, high energy neutrons flooding out of the plasma, they have no charge so the magnetic field has no effect on them and you need to capture them in some kind of blanket structure in, inside the main structural wall of your machine. We are envisaging, we have not tested this on JET, but ETA will test blanket modules. We're envisaging that that blanket is around a metre thick um, and it will do two things. It will slow down the neutrons um, by, by collisions with the lithium um, and once slowed, the, the lithium will react with the neutron to make tritium that feeds back in again. But in slowing down the neutrons, the lithium blanket will, we expect and predict, um, be heated up to temperatures of the order 4 to 600 degrees C um, and the rest is a thermal cycle like you would have in any, any other power plant. So you are using the blanket to turn the kinetic energy of the neutrons into steam and a turbine which for me is a little ironic that, that it's still going to be a steam cycle at the end making the electricity but that's not our job, that's the, the power station company's job. But that is the, the main mechanism. We do not allow the plasma to touch the walls and as, uh, as, the, as the question um, suggests, that would be unfeasible and the plasma would go out and be extinguished. So we have to rely on that blanket. Um, so I've got a question from John Evans. Um, how long will sensors last under neutron irradiation? We've, we can do some testing of that on jet and it is an issue for us in particular cameras um, uh, where, where we, 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 we're we trying to develop enough shielding to, to keep cameras that look inside through windows at the plasma but they certainly are, they do not like um, uh, very high energy neutrons coming out. Um, sensors will in, in some cases be have to be changed so um, we will have to go in on regular shutdown periods in the in the power plant life of a power plant and change um, some of the sensors that will have been damaged but um, it is an active area of research for us to shield and make sure that, that the really critical sensors continue to work that's really why we need ITER to test 
um, fusion for hours at a time in, in a big enough machine that it's producing power plant scale numbers of neutrons so that we can start to assess um, where we really need to put the efforts in that area. Okay, I've um, got another one from uh, Kirsty Gogan. Um, how do JET and ITER fusion projects compare to other efforts around the world, um, for example, um, ALKATOR, CMOD at MIT or TRI Alpha? Yeah, okay, um, <laughs> that could take me uh, several hours to answer, but I'll try and do it in a minute. Um, JET is one of 35, 40 tokamaks around the world, um, publicly funded like JET. There are uh, a dozen or 15 in Europe. Um, Alcator uh, is a device that's actually recently closed, but one of three big devices in the US. Um, in Japan, in China, all have uh, tokamaks of one kind or another. Extremely collaborative. They all have a different strength and feature um, that is aiming to, to put a particular um, spin on things, that are not spin, but a, a, a particular area of expertise that they can work on. The one machine I, I skipped over for time was our own UK experiment here called MAST, which is a more spherical shape and is particularly looking at the, the exhaust system, the ability to take the, the helium out without damaging the, the, the materials. So that's publicly funded and they're all feeding in and, and gaining knowledge for ITER um, uh, towards the first demonstration power station. So extremely collaborative and working very closely together. JET is the biggest and most powerful and unique in many ways, but the other machines are very important in, in upgrading our knowledge and understanding on these things. TriAlpha is one example of several privately funded fusion companies out there, many in the US, a couple in the UK, that are, are trying to do things sometimes with tokamaks, sometimes with very different devices, um, sometimes magnetic and sometimes with other confinement methods. Um, much too much for me to discuss here, I'm afraid, but that fusion is, uh, private fusion initiatives are growing very rapidly. Right, thank you. Um, there's been quite a few questions come through um, about Brexit and um, what effects that will have on um, the project and financing. <laughs> um, I was hoping for nothing on Brexit, but I guess, <laughs> that's, um, I guess that is uh, that, that was wishful thinking. Um, okay, uh, that might be even more complicated to explain. Um, the, 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 very roughly, the funding here for us UKA is split as follows. Uh, we have 100 million turnover, something like that. Um, of the order, 60 million comes directly through the European Commission um, to for us uh, to pay for 400 engineers and scientists and support staff like myself and others to make sure that we have a functioning jet for European scientists to come and use and a, and a, and a machine that is upgraded within the resources we have to make sure that we can keep learning and keep understanding towards a power plant. Um, the decision to leave the EU, for the UK to leave the EU is clearly not helpful towards that. The decision to leave Euratom, which is the nuclear part of Europe, um, which funds us as well as safeguards, uh, etc., been in the press a lot recently, uh, was even less helpful. Um, so it has a big effect. JET runs and is funded to run until the end of 2018. We have a strong program in 19 and 20 and we would hope to run beyond close up to when ITER starts but that would require the negotiations. Uh, some of those are happening on Euratom as well as the headline ones with David Davis and Michel Barnier. Um, there are many other negotiations going on. Um, uh, we do not know what the status of those are, of course, but we would hope to have some kind of close ongoing relationship um, after um, the present arrangements have finished. I can't really say much more than that. Um, it appears that things are moving in that direction, but uh, we don't know exactly uh, when or what we'll end up with. But it is a concern, of course. Okay, and um, we've got a few um, questions um, in regards to the comparison um, to um, nuclear fission. Um, so, in comparison, um, in regards to the capital costs um, being larger of um, fusion, yeah. And um, it looks like we're also asking about licensing requirements <coughs> as well as a comparison. Yeah. Um, the licensing one we don't really know yet, but we're, we're starting to engage and work out what we would need to do to license uh, a fusion device as opposed to fission. We obviously, ITER has had to be licensed in France, which is probably the toughest regulatory 
um, environment out there. So we're learning a lot from that, but that will be something we'd have to work with uh, and work out what is what is similar to to to, to a fission and what is very different in many ways, very different, of course. Um, in terms of overall cost, um, ITER is expensive, as you can see, and the first demonstrator, again, publicly funded. Um, Europe is designing up a first demonstrator to put electricity on the grid around 2050, um, as is China, as is Korea, um, on, on probably slightly shorter timescales. Um, we're looking at, at, at probably somewhere between 20 and 30 billion to build those first demonstrators. Of course, we would hope if fusion um, uh, really gets adopted that, that once you start to build more and more, the cost will come down. But it is fair to say with fusion, that the capital cost of construction of your plant will be significantly higher than many others, um, but the cost of your fuel will be negligibly small. Uh, I stress again, 400 kilos of fuel, deuterium and tritium, would keep a gigawatt power plant running for a year. So ridiculously small amounts of fuel that are relatively easy to extract. So compared to fossil fuels, you're not reliant on the cost of your fuels at all, but you do have a much higher capital cost. Um, licensing, I can't answer any more specifically, um, but I would also point out that compared to fission, certainly the decommissioning costs of fusion will be significantly lower. People have done a lot of predictions about cost of electricity from fusion and it looks competitive and that's important of course, um, but, but obviously until we get to build the first ones we won't know for sure. Okay, um, so I think we'll probably just have time um, for one more question and I might sort of blend these two together as they both seem to be a bit technical. Um, so we've got one from Stephanie Hernandez Santos um, that asks what kind of materials would be resistant to high energy neutrons in your opinion? And um, another one regarding um, disruptions in a working reactor and how can that be guaranteed that that won't happen? Okay, um, let's take the materials one first. I'm not a real expert. Um, but things like vanadium is, meant, is, is, is an attractive option. In terms of steels, um, uh, ferritic steels are much better than non-ferritic if, if memory serves. Um, and, and really it's a matter of, of looking at the composition of the steel, um, working out what you can minimize um, in there to um, minimize damage in terms of the, all the elements of steel. Um, that doesn't compromise too much uh, the physical integrity of it. So you want to keep its high material strength um, without compromising, um, without you know making it uh, too prone to damage from the neutrons. Um, you're looking at the neutrons going into dislocating atoms, forming voids, um, and, and if you're not careful, cracking the material. So uh, in some sense, I can hide a little bit behind the fact that you know we. we we fully expect that we will start to find better materials for our purposes um, with a very strong research program led by, by the materials research facility um, um, uh, and that will make the, the economics of fusion even better if we can find materials that means it will last longer um, but I'm not sure we really know what those are yet um, but certainly um, some steels are much better than those. vanadium is, is, is an attractive option. Um, sorry Andrew, remind me of the last one again, disruptions. Yeah, sure. Yeah, it was. Um, how can you guarantee no disruptions in a working reactor? Um, I, I don't think you can ever guarantee those things, but we are able in JET um, to pretty much every time spot the conditions when a disruption may well occur and adjust parameters on a very fast time scale to ensure it doesn't. A disruption is when you do lose control of the plasma, it becomes very unstable, uh, it wobbles very quickly and it hits the wall uh, and within five milliseconds, 10 milliseconds, it's gone. Um, that makes it inherently safe, but as, as the, the question is alluding to, uh, would, if I drew a very crude analogy, stop the electricity um, from a power plant? Um, I, I think if you're talking about a, a grid-based system, uh, then uh, living with the odd disruption on one of your power plants maybe wouldn't matter too much. But a scientific answer is that, that we are very clear on our understanding of what causes them. Um, and we can spot um, and and change parameters to prevent them happening pretty much all the time now. So they're much less common on JET than they used to be, unless we're doing them deliberately for some reason or another. 
Thank you, Chris. Um, I think we'll stop there because we do try and keep um, this within the lunch hour. Um, we really appreciate your time today, Chris, and um, we hope everyone um, found this talk to be um, really informative and interesting. Um, I'll be sending the video recording around um, following this um, so you can access that um, as well as share it with any of your colleagues. And um, yeah, thank you. Stay tuned for next month's webinar. Thank you very right. much. Thanks. Thank you, Chris. Bye. Bye.